What is colour? If someone were to ask you that question, what would you say? How do you explain what magenta looks like? It's a nice tree. Or how turquoise feels? There's a number of things you could say to define what colour is. It's our psychological reaction to different wavelengths of visible light. It's how we visually perceive our reality. But what would I answer? It's my favourite aspect of visual storytelling. And that's the question that we're going to answer today. How can colour tell a story? Film school, academy or institution, cinema or photography, they never teach us in the knowledge of art, mainly technology, which is very important technology, of course, in order to uh, be able to portray, to, to, to realise the idea. But nobody is explaining to us the meaning, the philosophy of light, the philosophy of colour. Since before we were even able to actualise sound in films, we've been obsessed with colour. Film has always been about the visual, and the primordial age of cinema displays a lens that we were willing to go to just to capture its essence. Before filters and cameras existed, innovators like Edison and Melier would hand tint their films. They would literally paint onto their film stock to enhance their images so they could become all the more wondrous. Colour was initially used to show the dreamlike quality of cinema. The fictional visual medium was the pinnacle of escapism, so colour was used to show how distant from our reality it was. But it didn't take filmmakers too long to discover that colour was an essential component of storytelling. It seemed as though a new way to colourise films was being made every day. Using tinting, film stock could be completely tinged to a certain colour. Famously in Intolerance, D.W. Griffith used an array of tints to show the difference between various periods of time. Filmmakers then developed on this usage of colour, with artists such as Benjamin Christensen realising our inherent psychological reactions to different colours. We would feel much more on edge when the screen was covered in red, which contrasted to the much more serene shots bathed in blue. Colour soon became a way to symbolise the inner workings of characters. In Eric von Stroheim's Greed, we follow a man whose wife wins a lottery. We see the money hand-tinted yellow, and by the end of the film as the man's possessiveness grows, the entire film is engulfed in yellow, symbolising the man's complete consumption in its use of colour alone. Cinema had just gained a new way of metaphoric storytelling. These are just a few examples of how colour is used to tell a story, but once Technicolor developed their three-strip colour technique, a brand new world of opportunity was open to us. We became completely free to use colour however we wanted, and artists began to understand the disciplines of aesthetics and symbolism. But how is it possible that the methods of the silent era have held through to the 21st century? Intolerance showed us the way colour can separate place and time. The same way Hero uses its art direction to show stories from different perspectives. Other films not only use colour to differentiate multiple stories, but use them to set the atmosphere for that particular story. A technique as far back as The Cabinet of Dr Caligari was still relevant in the digital age. Whether the tone is cold and hopeless, or gritty and dangerous, the colour serves that purpose. How did the pioneers of the art form know these techniques would work? Well, it stems from the most primal facets of us. Humans will always have innate psychological reactions to certain colours, and so particular colours are often used in very particular ways. But that doesn't make colour use exclusive. For example, red seems to be the colour that we have the strongest reaction to. But where one may use it as a depiction of hate and cruelty, another may use it to show passion and love. The same with green. A luscious green field gives us hope and shows fertility, but green locations also show the mundane and lifeless, and the green on a person tells us who the monster is. There are no set guidelines to say this is how you use colour, but understanding the cognitive effects of it does help. In Kill Bill, Uma Thurman's outfit not only becomes iconic through its colour use, but gives us a strong subconscious reaction to the character. Would her madness be better conveyed through beige attire, or this intense yellow that evokes feelings of the hazardous? Certain colours invoking specific emotional responses has been ever-present in our storytelling to this day. But when it comes to using it, an artist's greatest tool is not a degree in psychology, it's their ideas. And a lot of these ideas can be explained with one simple tool. Now there are three key elements to any colour. The hue, the saturation and the value. The hue is the actual colour, so is it red, orange, green, and so on. 
The saturation is how intense that colour is. So is it extremely vibrant, or is it a faded paler colour? The more desaturated something is, the closer it is to grey. And finally there's the value. If a colour has a low value, then it's darker than colours with a higher value. If you change any of these elements, then you change the tone of the film. Change the tone, and you have a different movie. Early cinema realised quickly how to evoke certain moods. However, in the world of Technicolor, things became more complex. Now we have colour schemes in our design, which arose after discovering that some harmonies work better than others. And I think these can be summed up into two purposes. Balance and discordance. These are just a few harmonies, and I'd encourage people to research more into colour theory to understand how colour is used effectively. Using these schemes correctly will result in a balanced image. One of the best filmmakers at utilising colour schemes today is Wes Anderson. Look at Moonrise Kingdom. The use of greens, browns and yellows means that the colours don't greatly contrast one another, and so it's pleasing to look at. He used an analogous colour scheme because it's calming, and it suits the film's nostalgic tone. Another common harmony you'll see is the complementary scheme. Colours on the opposite end of the wheel complement one another, so you'll often see red and green, blue and orange, or yellow and purple. Adding balance to the image means that nothing disrupts the flow of colour, and here we're seeing how colour affects the film's tone. But that doesn't mean that balance of colour can't be used to make a dark atmosphere. Apocalypse now used a balance scheme in Kurtz's compound, but the orange mist gave a feeling of toxicity in the air. Adversely, a film like Piero Le Fou may appear to have no set colour scheme, but it uses triadic colour, meaning that all the colours are an equal distance on the colour wheel. This playful balance creates the atmosphere of the film, making the impromptu rules of the world all the more believable. However, when you throw something in that doesn't fit the scheme, this creates discordance. Sometimes all this means is to have one saturated colour that doesn't quite fit in. This can give the audience's eyes a focus and a resting point or intentionally draw the audience's eyes towards something. One of the most important things to note about colour is that the audience will notice that which doesn't fit in, hence why game design uses bold, saturated colours for important objects. By introducing a new colour to an established scheme, this can be an effective method in showing that the mood of the film has been unsettled. So if colour can affect us on such an intrinsic level, surely it can be used to add context to the image. Again, going back to Wes Anderson, colour is often the context for his stories. In The Royal Tenenbaums, Gene Hackman does terrible things, but because of his pale pink clothing, we know not to take anything he does too seriously, as the colours render him silly. The same with the Grand Budapest Hotel. All you have to do is look at how colourful the images are to know that nothing here carries much emotional weight. Colour's effect on us is a psychological anomaly, and we may not know why it affects us, but it does. It's how we know, just by the colour of the lightsabers, who's good and who's evil. So yeah, we know that colour is often a psychological process, and that using it can create certain atmospheres. Creating a scheme around that colour can then emphasise that atmosphere. But this video is about colour in storytelling, and it can be used for more than just to set the mood. So with that said, what's the purpose of colour? Well I think I can sum up the use of colour into two separate categories associative and transitional. Allow me to explain. Whether it be the primary hue of a recurring colour scheme, or the repetition of specific colours throughout a film, single consistent colours in a story are used as associations. All this means is that we associate that colour to a certain subject or an idea. So let's say your character is associated with the colour purple. If we proceed to see purple in the future, we will know it's because that scene in some way is referencing the subject. We Need to Talk About Kevin is a film with very violent themes that features almost zero violence. However, the constant appearance of the colour red acts as a reminder to the audience that violence is the undercurrent to this entire story. In this instance, red is associated with blood. But that doesn't mean that all associations have to follow the social constraints of a colour. For instance, in The Godfather, orange is associated with death. This is to show that repetition of single colours in a scheme shows some kind of interrelation to an idea. If certain colours are occurring throughout a story, try and find the subject it's related to. That's the association. So if that's the purpose of consistent colours, then a changing colour shows transition. If a colour has been associated to a subject, and that colour then shifts, it signifies a change in something. Transitions can be something as simple as a location, or be something more complex, 
like your character's state of mind. In The Last Emperor, as the character discovers more about the world around him, the colour palette shifts. The world of tradition and the character's naivete is displayed by the world of red. However, as the character begins to learn more, the colour goes from red, to orange, yellow, and finally once he becomes fully comprehensive of his surroundings, he's bounded to green. The colours transition along with the subject's characteristics. This effective system of colour transition becomes even more unique when it's examined on the colour wheel, because red, orange, yellow and green are consecutive. To go from red to green shows that both the character and the wheel have turned 180 degrees. Colour transitions typically happen gradually over the course of films. Malcolm X's character arc in Spike Lee's eponymous biopic is reflected by the changing colours over time. However, if the subject's transition is more sudden, say the colour represents a change in threatening circumstance, then depending on the kind of film it is, the transition can be instantaneous. There's a reason behind every colour choice in a film. When watching a film that uses very specific colours, how do those colours make you feel, and how do they follow the characters? Why is it that the narrator's corporate life is in a dull green? Why is Schmidt constantly surrounded by blues? When you find the colour subject, the rest of the film can be told through the colour alone. For instance, blue is extremely prevalent throughout Blue is the Warmest Colour. Literally every scene has something blue in it. When Adele meets Emma, her hair is blue. So the colour represents Adele's freedom to express herself, as well as the love between her and Emma. Blue is associative, and the subject is Adele's relationship. Here we see that the social connotations of colours aren't set in stone. Love is represented by the colour blue instead of, well, take a guess. As we progress through the stages of the relationship, the colour scheme reflects this. During the happiest parts of the relationship, blue surrounds Adele and is very saturated, showing the intensity of her love. At her lowest, Adele is surrounded by much paler blues, showing that the love is fading, yet she's still consumed by it. Even more so, after an attempt to reignite their romance fails, the only blue we will see is a blue dress enveloped in a world of greys. This is an example of how colour is used to show the protagonist's relationship with another character using both associative and transitional colour. Vertigo uses another example of this. However, instead of just one colour, it uses both red and green to its advantage. Scotty's passion is represented by red, and Madeline is associated with the colour green. Scotty first sees Madeline wearing a green dress, surrounded by red. The red's intensity implies that Scotty's fantasy is dangerous, and throughout Vertigo, red is noticeable in scenes that are perilous as Scotty pursues his obsession. Everything relating to Madeline is green, from the clothes she wears to the car she drives. Later in the film, Scotty meets Judy, who he can't help but imagine as Madeline, and so as he wants Judy to become more like her, green begins to re-enter the colour scheme, until finally, the green from outside the hotel room fully engulfs Judy in its ominous glow. The subject of a colour association most of the time is a character, so how do you make that association? Clothing is one of the most common ways to do this, because characters will literally always be seen alongside the colour they wear, but it's not the only way it can be done. Here are your names. Mr. Brown, Mr. White, Mr. Blonde, Mr. Blue, Mr. Orange, and Mr. Pink. Why am I Mr. Pink? One of the most unique uses of this is in I Am Love. In one scene, two characters wear clothes that the other wore in the previous scene, giving subtle hints to their relationship. When you use transitional colour with a character by altering the colour scheme associated with them, it can be used to show a change within the character. Using colour schemes in clothes was essential in conveying the moral standings of characters in Breaking Bad. One of the best examples of character transitions comes in this scene. Having already transgressed over time into a more villainous state, our main character wears red, a much more nefarious colour. But just before he dives even further into his own evils, he removes his shirt to reveal a darker one. His visual presence represents his character arc. Something dark lies beneath the surface of Walt. Who are you talking to right now? I believe examples like these show colour to be the visual counterpoint between imagery and sound. It can be used to heighten the nature of our desires, or to be the final twist of the knife. It sets the groundwork for the emotional state of the film. Look at Videolab's essay on Man of Steel and how different both feels of the film are. It's the same footage, just desaturated, yet again showing colour's psychological effects on our minds. So the next time you're looking at a colour scheme, think of the psychological ramifications of that colour. Find the association, 
the transitions, and the film may discover itself to you more than the words could. Roger Deakins said that it's easier to make colour look good, but harder to make it service a story. And he's probably right, but let's try and prove him wrong. <laughs>